I would like to begin by acknowledging the Boon Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation as the original custodians of the land from which I'm broadcasting. I pay deep respects to their ancestors. I'd also like to acknowledge and pay respects to the Awabakul and Wurrumi people and their ancestors, as these are the lands upon which the National Young Writers Festival operates. Also, the Wurundjeri people and their ancestors upon whose land the Express Media Offices sit. I acknowledge that this land was taken by force and without consent, and that First Nations have never ceded sovereignty. It always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Hi, my name is Danielle Binks. I'm an author and literary agent and the 2021 Hachette Australia Prize for Young Writers Mentor. The prize is sponsored by Hachette Australia and administered by Express Media, Australia's peak youth literary organisation. The prize aims to ignite passion for creative writing and poetry in the minds of Australia's secondary school students and to encourage them to pursue writing and publishing opportunities inside and outside of the classroom. It was my absolute pleasure to read a selection of entrants this year and be offered but a glimpse of the emerging writing talent Australia has and will continue to nurture. There was a ferocious desire to understand the real world in this year's entrance. A fierce dedication to dismantling the everyday. And even those who have flecks of magic in their writing, there's still a realism tethering them. Clearly the world has looked more inward and young people are too, with sharp observations of how the personal is political and our local surroundings are worthy of storytelling sagas. These entrants are sharp and wonderful and reading them has given me hope and joy to think of what's to come from Australia's next and emerging generation of writers. It's now my great pleasure to present you the Hachette Young Writers Prize 2021 shortlist. The fiction shortlist was absolutely incredible, guttural and tender, a real hark to the contemporary and realistic again, but with flecks of magical realism, these were a complete joy to read. And it is my great pleasure to list you now the fiction shortlist. From New South Wales, Rush Hour by Fei Chung. From Victoria, Leap Year's Boy by Maya Crombie. From WA, Orange Peels by Pavati Dinesh. Again from WA, 298 Days and One Lagoon by Hannah Pemberton. And a third from WA, Gubba by Kayla Jessenowski. Congratulations everyone on the fiction shortlist. This is Rush Hour by Fei Chen. It's Rush Hour, and Ophelia has just bought her a bag of sour worms from the convenience store as a consolation gift. They're sitting by the curbside, one sour worm in each mouth. Talia's is green and orange, while Ophelia's is yellow and red. Look, Ophelia says, drudging a strawberries and cream chop chop from the depths of her bag and fiddling with its wrapper. It's not that you're not cool or anything, you're really cool, and I like you a lot. Talia snatches the lolly out of her hand, scratches the plastic wrapper open efficiently, and passes it back, face blank. Ophelia clears her throat. Well, in the friend way. I like you a lot as a friend, just not in... you know. She shoves the chop chop wrapper back into her bag, and stares at the lolly for a few seconds anxiously before shoving it in her mouth. It's not you, really. It's just that I don't even know if I like... <clears throat> Ophelia clears her throat again, and shrugs. I'm probably straight. That's all I'm saying. Talia nods. She's staring at the curb where their feet are. Ophelia's got on sneakers with an LV on the back, clearly drawn on in red sharpie. To the left of her back heel is an amalgamation of mandarin brand stickers, peeled off peels and stuck resolutely to the asphalt. Their edges are frayed and their colours have been watered down. It's a wonder that they hadn't been washed away. It's been a while since it last rained, so only the part of the street closest to the dream is slightly damp. Talia picks a scab of grass off the front of her own shoes. It's okay, she replies. It was only the third rejection in her life, and it was noticeably less disastrous than the others. Madison had cut her off entirely after a lengthy speech on Christian virtue and homosexuality, and Lily had given a long self-victimizing monologue, which ended up with her breaking down and confessing about her boyfriend of three years that she still hadn't told her parents about. Ophelia nudged Talia on the shoulder and held out another chop chop. Spare one. Found it in a side pocket. You want it? She extended it out like an olive branch. At least Ophelia still wanted to be friends. No thanks. It was orange flavored. 
Ophelia shrugged and squinted out towards the west where the sun was setting. She stood up, shouldering her bag. Anyways, I should probably be heading home. Mom wants to get some groceries on the way. She adjusts the strap of her bag and holds out the orange lolly again. You sure you don't want it? Talia stands up as well. No, I'm alright, thanks. She makes a small smile, just so Ophelia would know she wasn't pissed off, and found her way down the street to where she parked her car. This is 298 Days and One Lagoon by Hannah Pemberton. That's me. One. There has never been a formal assessment of the salinity of Cognac Lagoon, but Jamie has her estimates. Estimates from the cool wash of water on her legs, the minor sting on half healed scrapes, the brackish scent filling her head. When she tastes the water, it's fresh, hypotonic on her tongue but the sting and open wounds burns her nerves with its validity. It's an ongoing process, this distillation of reality from observation. Jamie's legs simmer in the heat, a strand of purple hair falling across her nose and obstructing her vision. She huffs and it jumps up from her face, and the Vanadil Blue Lagoon is an unspoiled sight before her until the strand suddenly falls back into place. She stands atop the craggy plinth, barefoot, and feels its heat conduct into her souls. Without further thinking, she jumps and dives, perfect form. The arrow of her arms pierces the water, segregates it into two curtains flanking each side of her, before her body meets the briny cool and the curtains close. She is weightless, floating on the pathetic concentration of salt. Her eyes are closed, her legs curled up to her stomach, savouring this moment after the shock has hit her system. She only concedes when her lungs begin to struggle. She parts the skin on her neck and water flushes into her open gills. Now with a brackish in her system, Jamie can better tell its salinity. 12 parts per litre. Breathing easy, Jamie pulls herself out of indulgent. Her head breaks through the lagoon sky and she sticks her neck out above. Her dripping cheeks are already burning from the dry air. Her lips are chapped. She scans the rocky shore and spots a statue-like figure watching from above, a parallel set of eyes shooting upright, upright but tense and still. I told you, Jamie shouts. She grits to show off the two rows of sharp teeth now happily op occupying her mouth. Birdie, the statue, tumbles over. Hi, I'm Kaylee Jasnowski and this is my story, Gubba. Gleaming down on me, the sun roasted my skin like a marshmallow on a campfire, and my feet charred in the scorching red dirt around me that enveloped all land as far as the eye could see. The lofty metal clothesline cast many reedy lines over the ground, and the bronze skin of my two siblings who sat in front of me. I watched as two drops of sweat travel down my arm. It reminded me of the race I just won against my Bavana and Juraman. The neighbourhood was strangely quieter today than usual, but it didn't seem to bother us. Regaining our energy, we set our sides for bringing small glasses of tepid badu, preparing ourselves for another game. We were to play hide and seek next. Placing our glasses down on the table, we paused to decide who would be it in our first game. As we came to a decision, the fun was put on hold when our younger rushed out of the house and demanded that we come inside immediately. Her usually joyful voice now sounded tense and uneasy. Almost immediately, we stood up and began the gloomy walk to the front door. When thunderous noises came from behind me, and all of the dirt where we had just sat suddenly lifted up from the ground in an immense garaguru of red smoke. From this dust arose a copious number of figures. These figures were hefty, square-shaped containers that, after further observation, seemed to be carrying people. But not just any people. They were gubba. Forcing us into the bathroom, Marbianga locked the door behind us. Did she want to play hide-and-seek too? She could have just asked. Waiting around for a while, my siblings and I became curious of the events occurring beyond the thick wooden door that blocked our view. Placing our heads against the door in an attempt to hear any sort of sound that could give us a clue to, as to what was going on, we heard our younger scream. There were many continuous bangs and yells until all of a sudden there was silence.
Now to announce the Hashtag Australia Prize for Young Writers winners. And in the fiction category, congratulations to Leap Years Boy by Maya Crombie. This was the most interesting and fully rounded concept. We thought it was sublimely well done. We love the voice especially. We found it very wonderful and compelling. The ideas and how they were presented in the text were so interesting. But I do have to say that we also had a very interesting and enjoyable time discussing Gubba and Orange Peels. Both of those had raw elements, but the voice in both of those sung through as well. Congratulations to everyone on the shortlist and well done to Leap Year's Boy by Maya Gromby. Hi, my name is Maya and this is my short story, Leap Year's Boy. February put the fish into the microwave. It was all curled up and sad and the way that it turned inside made him think of a broken ballerina in a music box. As it spun, February felt a familiar discomfort. This was what he felt when watching game shows with his father, or listening to someone get teased at school, as if he was waiting for the fish to start crying. When the machine beeped, he took the plate out and set it down on the countertop. A trail of chimney smoke floated upwards. February poked it and realised that it was all soft and malleable. He thought about its fragility, its freshness. With a knife, he cut into the flesh of the fish and then unzipped it all the way down. He removed the entrails and put the shell of the fish in a bucket by the back door. The next step was the apples. He washed them in the kitchen sink and looked out the winter window and onto the fog. The sky was an early morning gradient of blue and yellow. February was excited for the violet that would come with twilight. There was a light tickle in his gut. It had probably come from the cheap meat last night. He wondered where the meat had come from. Old MacDonald had a farm, E-I-E-I-O, but decided not to pursue the thought any further. He used the same knife to cut the apples. It left bloody stains on the apple's crunchy flesh. The half moon slices went into the bucket by the back door and sort of smiled at him. He took the bucket and left the house. The bucket made squelching and sloshing sounds and tapped at his leg. This was February's morning. Glockenspiel wind chimes outside remind the forest creatures to go to bed. Bird song receding blanket of fog part for you as you walk. Last ornaments dew on leaves decorating the way just for you. February Barnes walked down Alvin Street and then left onto Vasey Avenue and then right onto Marsh Street and then right again onto the street with the name he couldn't remember. He stopped at the forest gate. He stopped to look into the woods, maybe to see a flash of light or to hear the whisper of a name. And then he started walking again because he swore, he swore he saw something standing in between the curtains of orange leaves. February kept up a steady pace all the way to her house. Hers was a familiar box among the others. He crept across the synthetic lawn and to the side of the house. Lucky for him, her room was on the bottom floor. She wanted the attic room though, which has always had the attic room. He tapped on the window softly and left the bucket hidden in the bushes under the windowsill. She always left the bucket there for him to collect and then fill up. Back on the sidewalk, he felt a childlike relief. February liked doing things for Lennon. He liked being friends with the witch. Most people didn't like her much, something about a disturbing aura. But since he could remember, he'd always admired her. Sometimes he'd ask the flowers what they thought. Petals love me not, lying dead in the old grass, forget the daisy. They met at the gate when the sun was beginning to splinter through the trees. February felt a slow building pressure on the side of his head and a distortion of vision in his right eye, disturbing aura. Are you all right? She asked. He said that he was. She hesitated. You look paler than normal. Are you sure? He said again that he was. The fuzzy, colourful blur in his right eye danced. He followed her through the trees. Trees that scratch the sky instead of caressing it. Trees that draw blood from the sky, the white, cloudy sky. Charred, burnt, black, bare trees. She held the bucket in her hands and swung it around like an unstuffed animal. The luridness, the cursedness, the cruelty of the act didn't seem to bother him anymore. It had become a standard activity on their schedules. Needles prickled behind his eye and the band around his head began to tighten. 
the fuzzy, colourful blur in his right eye danced. They hurried along with a stiffness that could have easily turned into a sprint at the snap of a branch. The forest filled their silence with ambience. February assumed that she'd added to the bucket. Lennon was mysterious in that way. She could make plastic things seem precious. She could lay a, a new secret into childish adventures. She could pull him out from under his sheets and convince him to just come along. The fuzzy, colourful blur in his right eye danced. They finally made it to the lake. A film of orange leaves and dead insects concealed murky depths. The lake was a cedar, beer bottle brown, but this didn't stop the kids from swimming in it on hot days. A rickety, mossy pier protruded out from the muddy bank and over the water. There was a wooden dinghy tied to a post by a rope. It bobbed up and down and floated lamely. Lennon left the bucket on the pier. Together, they set the boat out onto the lake and manoeuvred it into the middle. That way they can't get you. That way they can't sneak up behind you. The fuzzy, colourful blur in his right eye danced. She covered them with some blankets, one she knitted herself. With an old portable radio, she played music. Piano Sonata Number 14. By now, the sun had completely dipped under the trees, and they both felt the cold seeping through their clothes. The fuzzy, colourful blur in his right eye danced. Lennon scratched at her nail polish, and February dangled his fingers into the water. He closed his eyes, and something told him like who's until he fell asleep. Cosmic Number 4. Human sleep makes way for us. Roam the roads with glow. Scratch around the walls, still mistaken for the wind, we will fill the void. Wind laced with smoke blows through the crimson sky tonight. World keeps on spinning. She shook him awake. The aura was gone. All that was left was a dull throb that heightened when he moved his head. A misty dark blue light and her torch were the only things illuminating her face. They'll be here soon, she whispered. He asked her what the time was. I don't know, late enough. The moonlight glinted on the water, underneath the pier, and a strange alien light kept a few rows of trees in sight. It was quiet until... Ding, ding, ding. The tinkling of bells straightened the two of them up. He felt a presence. It happens every week, but you still get scared. He felt as if something fragile was hovering behind him, or touching him. He imagined butterflies crawling over his back and stroking him lovingly. He turned around. Sitting on the pier, lapping at the bucket, was one of them. Looking at one of them was always like looking at words. You had to read, you had to wonder and to question and to try to understand. He envied their mystery. They were like animals with child masks. They were ghostly and pale and glowing. Shimmering rainbow at the edges. You should see them dance. It made eye contact with Lennon and he watched the two of them hold it for a while. He could see the mutual respect. Sing for us, Lenny. Please sing. We like it when you sing. All right. Yawning. We'll dance too. Yes. Okay. This song is from Shakespeare. It's one my brother liked. Do you know my brother? He doesn't... isn't alive anymore. We know him, yes. He dances with us. He's here now, watching. Oh, good. Philomel with melody. Sing in our sweet lullaby. Lulla, lulla, lullaby. Lulla, lulla, lullaby. Never harm, nor spell, nor charm. Come our lovely lady nigh. So good night with lullaby. For a while, there was a wonderful pause. It continued dancing and hummed the melody of her words. It stretched its arms out to the dinghy and held them both in comforting hugs. Actually, the blankets seemed ridiculous in comparison. Come along, come along to our silent tea party. Come along, Lenny. Yes, the others miss you. And so they went along. They always did. The nonfiction shortlist. This was incredibly hard to judge because all of the entrants were absolutely amazing and finished to such a high degree. Each and every one of you are authors in the making, writers right now. It's my great pleasure to announce the shortlist. From Tasmania, Nana by Miranda Guy. From Victoria, Watching the Wheel Spin by Ruby Wiggins. 
Also from Victoria, Grief's Strange Walk by Sienna Bora. From Tasmania, What Home Is by Lara Vincent. And from Queensland, Personal Mysticism by Isabella Ferris Green. Congratulations to the nonfiction shortlist. I know you're not supposed to have a favourite grandparent, but when I was little, I didn't know any better. Nana was my favourite by far. She was the first person I wanted to spend weekends and holidays with, and whenever I was upset, she was there to calm me. If I got into a fight with my parents, I would tell them I was going to live with Nana. Poppy was admitted. My grandparents lived in an elaborate triple storey house, complete with thousands of hidden cupboards and nooks. I could have sworn another hidden door was added each time I went to visit. The grounds were an even bigger labyrinth. You could end up on the verge of a cliff or lost in the forest. There was peace in hearing nothing but water birds and cracking gum leaves and the echo of our voices if we sang loud enough. The quiet almost invited us to countervail the past sounds of Risdon Vale's two carronades. At six years old, I was convinced Nana lived in a castle and each time I went to stay, we would go on a quest to find something new. For each new thing we uncovered, Nana would tell me a story. Storytelling was in her blood. Her great-great-great-grandmother was Fanny Crockin Smith, a prominent Tasmanian Aboriginal and renowned storyteller. Many of Nana's stories were about Fanny Smith or culture, and each had an important message. One of the most memorable stories she told me was after a long quest through the upstairs wardrobe. We had found two guardian angel pins that Nana had bought during her travels, long before I was born. Each was embellished with one of our birthstones, a peridot and a sapphire. One for you, one for me, she said, and I chose green. It was Nana's birthstone, but to me, she was the colour blue. Wherever Nana went, blue would appear. In the soles of her slippers, in the glass bottles that lined the window sills, in the pebbles and flowers on our adventures, and in the sky. After tacking our pins onto our jumpers, we returned from our quest and baked a batch of chocolate chip biscuits, listening to Susan Boyle's I Dreamed a Dream over and over. It was Nana's favourite song. We ate our briskets fresh out of the oven and Nana told me a story about Fanny and her mother, Tanga Natura. It went like this. In Palawa spirituality, it is said that family members can communicate with each other through a little twitch in their arm. If a loved one has a message for you, you will feel them calling you. After Fanny married her husband, a Scottish man, she moved far away from the coast. Living on the other side of the state made communication with her mother difficult, but not impossible. One evening, Fanny felt a twitch in her arm and knew that her mother needed her. She told her husband and they set off by horse immediately. When they reached Tanganatura late at night, the first thing that she said to her daughter was, did you hear me calling you? Within the next few days, Tanganatura had passed away, but with this connection, they never parted. Hello. My name is Sienna Bora, and today I'm going to be reading my non-fiction piece, Grief's Strange Walk. So let's go. <laughs> my eyes opened slowly. Grass was under my hands. I was confused. All I could see was black nothingness and one strip of bright light. I looked towards the light and called out, Mum, Mum. My voice was so quiet. This scared me because I was yelling, but all I could make was a whisper. I tried to move forward, but I couldn't. So I turned, trying to see if I could notice anything. Next to me, I saw a large silver shiny metal object. I didn't know what it was. I looked down and under that metal thing was a hand. It had blood running down its knuckles. It didn't scare me, I just looked at it. I started to cry then. I wanted my mum. The bright light suddenly became dark and hands were reaching in and grabbing me. It's okay, I've got you, okay? It was my mum. I held her so tightly as light flooded my vision. It was so bright, I couldn't see anything. My leg hurt and nothing was normal. She carried me over to a woman, a stranger, who was sitting near the curb and gave me to her. All I could see was that she was old and all I knew was I didn't want to be with her. I just wanted my mum, but my mum was gone. I could hear her screaming. She was yelling for help 
and I was calling, come back, mum, mum, come back. The woman was trying to soothe me, but I didn't want her. I didn't even know who she was. Soon, more people arrived with blankets and they were trying to cover me. This made me angry and I tried to fight, but my leg hurt too much and I was just too tired. So I gave up and I just lay there on the hard, hot ground, surrounded by voices. Out of a corner of a gap in the blanket, I could see a man wearing a fluoro orange work jacket. His head was leaning backwards and his mouth was open and three people were holding him up. His hands were folded pathetically on the asphalt. I looked away. Nothing made sense to me. Although I Nine of Swords, fear, anxiety, isolation. I am the one person in my grade three class that does not do religious education. I colour in snow white printouts while the ancient church volunteer preaches Christianity to the rest of my class from my corner surrounded by colouring pencils. I am quietly judgmental. God associates himself in my head with idiocy and violence. He is an icon of the oppressive patriarchy, an idea that is not quite my own, but that I eagerly pick up. And I leave faith well alone, or I attempt to. The first time I pray, it is because I do not have any other option. I am alone in my room and terror is white hot in my veins and I get down on my knees, close my eyes and clasp my hands and I, the stringent atheist, implore God for asylum. God, who has white hair and hard eyes and a male jaw and always is situated above me, I imagine he looked down on me with disdain how pitiful I was in my desperation. My prayer is answered and even in my shaking gratefulness, I assure myself it was just a coincidence. I have a friend in grade nine who gives out a book on evolution. It refutes God with science and mocks theism and my friends parrot it. I join in conversations where we all laugh at how blindly stupid faith is because I have never liked being left out. My mother's spirituality is a notion I have been peripherally aware of for years. The faith that has carried her through everything that has been terrible in her life is quite foreign to me. And while I politely disbelieve in her notion of the universe, I become lonely. It is my great pleasure to announce the nonfiction winners this year because there are two with equal prize pool. We simply could not choose between Watching the Wheel Spin by Ruby Wiggins and What Home Is by Lara Vincent. These two were just brilliant and I need both authors to know that they are writers right now and writing to such a high, incredible degree. These two, I feel confident in saying, made us glow from within reading their entries. I need them to persevere and keep writing because knowing that the caliber of story coming out of emerging young nonfiction writers today and that the kids aren't just okay they're assured and integral to the future of our robust publishing industry and the discussions our society needs to be having case in point is these two and that's why there had to be two winners there just did congratulations to ruby wiggins and lara vincent hi my name is ruby wiggins and this is my piece watching the wheel spin. It's an autumn afternoon. I'm perched on the edge of the playground in my own world of thought. The bell for lunch has just gone and everyone is scattering off into their friendship groups to decide how they want to spend their lunchtime. The only thought on my mind is, I wish you were here. I feel so lost. My best friend is away today, fighting off a cold. It's the second time in three years that we've been friends, but she hasn't been here. Usually I'm the one taking the time off, 
we've only got each other and it hasn't occurred to me until now how lonely she must feel. Cutting across my worried thoughts, a voice calls out to me, Ruby, come play with us. It's Phoebe, a girl that I've known since kindergarten. I feel conflicted. If I go and play with her, I'm betraying Celine, my only friend. It just feels so wrong, but if I don't, this is going to be the longest lunchtime in history. I make my decision and run over to the group of girls. I hope that they'll be playing fairies. I love fairies. What are we playing? I ask timidly over the chatter of the group. Mums and dads, Elizabeth answers. She is by far the most popular and confident in this group. She wears her hair in a high ponytail and always wears a tinted pink lip gloss. I'm not even sure if she's allowed to wear that. The uniform is very strict, after all. How do we play? I ask. The concept doesn't sound very appealing. We all act out being in a family together, Elizabeth says. I'm the mum, Charlotte, you can be the little sister, Phoebe, you can be the dad, and Jada, you're the little sister, she instructs. Who am I? I ask. Well, you can either be the little brother or the dog. The dog, I think. Who would want to be the dog? They bark randomly and then they jump and they bite. I'll be the brother, I sigh. The next 10 minutes are just utter chaos. People speaking over the top of each other, people changing the time of day that the scene is supposed to take place. There's no logical order or reason or rhythm to this game. How is this supposed to be fun? I'm standing awkwardly at the edge of the group, watching this group of girls. When Celine and I play together, it's never like this. We have fun games, ones that make sense, like watching for fairies, like we're in the Rainbow Magic books. Another one of our favourite things is playing in the wooden cars on the playground and pretending that we're teenagers on a road trip. Celine and I have been friends since we were four. We always stick to one game the whole time. Although watching for fairies isn't a game, it's very serious business. Standing awkwardly at the edge of the group makes me realise I'm an outsider in this group. No matter how hard I try to be like them, I won't ever be like them. That's okay. I have a perfectly good group, a tight group of two, Celine and I. I, I decide to give up on this group and slip away. Nobody notices. I sit down outside the year two classrooms on the retaining wall and wait for the bell to go. Another 15 minutes. I sigh and watch the rest of my classmates playing happily with not a care in the world. I want to join them, but I don't know how. What do I say? I don't want to barge in and annoy anyone. The bell finally goes and I stand outside of our classroom to line up, alone, and I don't have a partner. Another stinging reminder of how lonely I feel. Usually I adore school, but not today. Not even writing stories is making me feel better. 3.30 couldn't have come any quicker. I meet my mum out the front of the school and we go to my appointment. I tell my mum about my lonely day without Celine and she hugs me. These are good things to talk to Gloria about today. My mum says gently. I nod. At 18 months of age, I was diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome or high functioning autism. My mum knew that I wasn't developing properly because she is an occupational therapist. I had an obsession with the Wiggles and I would sit in front of the TV watching them for hours. I loved playing with cars, but not in the conventional way. I would hold the toy cars upside down and just spin the wheels. I loved stimulation, especially the swings. I would be pushed on the swing for hours at a time and I just adored it. These subtle differences became less subtle as I grew older, but I didn't realise this at the time. I began therapy almost right away to try and give me the best possible chance of a happy and healthy life. I did physiotherapy to help me move and walk better, speech therapy to support my language development and teach me social rules, occupational therapy to help with my fine and gross motor skills. The list grew and changed as I developed. I was one of the lucky few girls that received early intervention. Unfortunately, so many other girls and young women with more subtle and or less obvious symptoms don't receive that crucial early support. When most people think of autism, they think of stereotypical presentations. Young, white, school-aged boys who have no interest in interacting with others, disrupt learning and study train timetables. They might be a prodigy in maths or science, but that is just the tip of the iceberg. There is so much more to autism than society and the media presents to us. 
What about that quiet girl who sits at the back of the classroom and always had her, has her head in a book? What about that successful 30-something-year-old writer with crippling anxiety who adores fashion? These are the sorts of people who fly under the radar. The ones who have become so good at adapting and changing themselves to meet the expectations of the people around them. The ones who are so good at pretending to be someone else. The ones who have good behaviour and high marks in school. The ones who only realise that they're different when they reach adolescence and these coping mechanisms no longer seem to work. The diagnostic statistics for autism are thought to be four to one. That, just for reference, that is, that is four male diagnoses to every one female one. Just for reference, 52% of the world's population is female. How can that possibly match up? Why do so many females fly under the radar until they just can't cope anymore? Older children and adolescents struggling with undiagnosed autism usually develop anxiety, depression and poor self-esteem before they even receive a professional assessment or any help at all. These statistics need to change. Imagine what a detrimental effect this must have on those who have never received support or were diagnosed late. These young women who are missed are proven to have more difficulty in leading happy and healthy lives. Why? Even in the 21st century, do we still allow our girls and women to suffer in silence? This needs to change. A month or so after that, um, that lonely lunchtime, I began to notice changes in the people around me. Celine and I would go out to play as normal, but the teachers began to act differently. Every time we, they would notice Celine and I playing together, we would be told off and separated. We didn't know why. We missed each other so much and we would cry when we were put in different friendship groups, always at separate ends of the playground. We used to sneak out at lunch together and hide in different parts of the playground and hope that the yard duty teachers wouldn't spot us, just so that we could play together. Time went on and she was moved into the other class. We stopped talking because we had no classes together and we weren't allowed to mix at breaks. I was inconsolable. I have no one now. For years after that, I was left with the constant burden of the questions. What's wrong with me? What did I do wrong? But little did I know that it was Celine's mother who complained to the school so many times that the school had no choice but to listen. Why did she complain, you may be wondering? Because I was autistic. Let that sink in. Her mother thought that her daughter was catching autism off me as if autism was wildly contagious and transmissible. Need I say any more? Five years later, I arrive at school early, as I always do. It's a cold winter's morning and I head to the library, like I always do. I'm allowed to be here in the mornings, so I don't bother trying to find a group of kids that I can sneak in with. I say good morning to Miss Ritchie, the teacher librarian. I head to the back of the library and I notice the spot where the popular girls usually sit, vacant. They always hog the heater and now it's all mine. I sit on the floor in front of the heater and I take a book that I hid in my blazer and begin to read, feeling on top of the world. I sink into the pages of the book, unaware of the rapidly filling library around me. I don't want to know. I just want to find out who the murderer is. I feel a gentle nudge of my feet and I nearly fall sideways with the shock. Sorry, Elizabeth mutters. I look up and see her entire group of friends sitting in the comfy chairs around me. High ponytails and light makeup, none of them wearing their blazers. Everyone knows that your jumper can't be your outer layer and that you can't wear makeup. My insides are writhing with the anger of their disregard for the rules. Sure, nobody likes the strict uniform policy, but we all have to follow it. What are you reading? Peyton asks. My heart skips a beat. I was just addressed by one of the most popular girls in the school. Act cool, Ruby. Act cool. I'm reading about a murder mystery about two students who investigate the death of their principal. I say, my voice wobbling slightly. Cool. How cool would it be if Mrs. Holman was gone? Holly says. Oh, oh no. I didn't mean it like that, I think. What do I do now? Elizabeth nods and abruptly changes the topic. I don't really get what they're saying. Something about a birthday party and ditching school to meet some boys from the boys' campus. I make the decision to sacrifice my position in front of the heater and slip away from the group. I've become very good at this now, being a wallflower. 
I check the time briefly and make the decision to start walking towards the classroom. The bell will ring in two minutes. I have not been able to develop an idea of what home is to me. Home isn't family. I have no real family I wish to associate with. I live alone and I haven't kept any of the 17 foster ones. Home isn't location. I've moved everywhere from Deepston to New Norfolk, so even the Tasmanian landscape isn't familiar to me. Home isn't what I make it, because I haven't been able to make it. Everywhere I've lived has made me unhappy and stressed. I used to have a saying that I don't have a home, I have a house. Which is ironic, as most of the time I didn't even have that. When I first began to live semi-independently, the people in charge would often remind me that it wasn't my house, it was theirs. The concept of home is unfamiliar to me, so I often scoff if someone says a place reminds them of home or that the environment is where they belong. I'm not trying to be derisive when I do so, I just haven't been able to experience it, so the idea is foreign to me. I cannot relate to that yearning of home that movies depict, that people strive to create, that soldiers fight to protect. For me, the idea of home is like a damaged painting, a beautiful concept, but broken. I have severe trust issues. Despite now living alone, I tiptoe around the house because it's dangerous to be heard. I hate to sit in silence and I constantly look over my shoulder. How can I feel truly at home if I constantly fear that someone will take it? Someone might come inside to hurt me, remove my space, send me somewhere else or control me. I treasure my control over my space because I've never had the chance to before. I've been asked before if the people in my life could be where home is and so far, my answer is no. Not only are the most important people in my life separated around the state, but I also don't let myself grow too close to people. I have called one too many women mum only to have them reject me. I've had too many toxic friends, too many families, too many guardians to feel like anyone is family. I've been hurt too many times by the people who promise to love me and keep me safe. My biological family is composed of murderers, drug abusers, anti-vaxxers and arsonists. I do not associate them where I, with them where I can help it. I know there are people out there who care for me, but my logical side can't rationalise this to the scared, bruised girl who continues to exist in my subconscious. The girl who waits for them to leave her as everyone else has. For me, my life goal is more about stability than home. I have already experienced more hardships than most people should have to. And I'm only 17. I've lacked control in my life for far too long. And so now my goal is simple, stability. I've been a youth consultant for many years, championing for youth rights, both in the care system and out. I've talked about my life experience and the changes I want to make. And whilst those changes would have helped me if they'd existed earlier in my life, I now don't wish or expect for anyone or anything to help me. I don't want lots of money, although the reassurance that it would bring would be nice. I don't want kids, both because I feel that with my upbringing I wouldn't know how to raise one, but also because the idea disgusts me. I share my body with no one. It is mine and I have soul control. I don't want a super thrilling job or fancy items or fame. I want simplicity, stability, a life where I want for nothing that I cannot achieve myself. That's not to say I don't have a purpose in mind. I want to prove myself. I want to show my sister a better role model than my other siblings. I want to show my mother that I know what I'm doing. I want to show my father that the daughter he ne nearly destroyed was stronger than he was. What I want is a simple house, three bedrooms, one bathroom with a bath, and one kitchen that connects to the lounge. A small deck and a shed to store things. A big fluffy rug, hardwood flooring and a comfy couch. Nothing huge. I want an open plan space with big windows that don't trap me inside. I want a small personal library of the books I have collected. I want a fluffy dog, a big cat and a few rats. Creatures which have never hurt me. Creatures who know how much love I can provide. I want a simple marriage to the love of my life and a job as an art conservator where I spend my time repairing paintings. Paintings which have been damaged from neglect, abuse and lack of care will be carefully fixed by my expert hand and displayed for the world to see. 
I want a life where I don't need to stress because I've spent enough time stressing. The question of what is home holds little meaning to me. Home is non-existent, a beautiful little lie upon which perfect people reassure the broken that peer through the windows. Home is fear, an inconsistent concept which slips through my grasp every time I begin to hope. Some people like to place their idea of home in the concept of God, an almighty being which provides the stability and love that home represents. I wish it were that simple for me. If I could give up my control and worry and believe that a God was out there protecting me, it would make it so much easier. But if there is a God, I believe he has forsaken me. Why else would he not help me as I begged him at the age of five to save me from the wandering hands of the devil in human flesh? Why, when I cried for him at nine to provide me the warmth I craved when locked outside on yet another cold night? Why, when I screamed for my sister to be protected from her father who existed only to share hell with the both of us? I cannot bring myself to accept a God if he allows the suffering of innocence to continue. If he couldn't save me then, I cannot believe that he would save me now. I've been asked if I ever believe I'll find home. As pessimistic as I am, the same little girl buried deep within my mind clings to the hope that I will. I choose to believe that with time and effort, I will one day find that stability, the place that is mine and that I long to return to, the place in which I feel safe. It is difficult to allow myself to believe, but I'm nothing if not resilient, and I owe it to the girl that I was. And when I do, I believe I'll understand those people in the movies who long to return to that small town in which they grew up. I will understand those hopeless romantics who follow the call of the wilderness, the pull of a heart. That painting will be mended, and I will understand the blood that countless warriors have shed in order to protect the one place they truly belong. Home. The shortlisted entrance in the poetry category was sharp and assured and absolute pleasures to read. I can't wait to see what these authors do next. The poetry shortlist. From WA, The Colour Hypothermia by Tom Hunt. From New South Wales. What the River Man Tells Me by Maxine Chen. From New South Wales, Box by Yihad Yassin. From Queensland, Thug Life by Melissa Von Guy. From New South Wales, X by Fei Chung. Congratulations to the poetry shortlist. My name is Tom Hunt, and this piece is entitled The Colour Hypothermia. At the slow end of a snow-ridden day, smog stalls in the air like tar, and the walls crackle whispers underneath a max exodus of warmth. Powers out again. Air swarms like a bouquet of funeral blackness, bursting, flowering at the crown of my skull and making my bones soggy. Swinging it away helps no one, only changing the wallows of my wake. Frying pans aren't dream catchers, but there's nothing else better to use. The bath water's long since gone cold, but it's still preferable to the metal sink surrounding me. Flecks of mould and misery float around the surface of it but lurking underneath its cakey horizon are still green eyes that fleet like a spectacle of metal dust and malignancy. And they stare, like a premonition. People like to tell me that rage is the colour red, the colour of pasted gore, but the unwashed rags of this place tell me otherwise. It's the colour of freshly bruised rot flowering out of cracked hands. It's the colour of infections and maladies and the cracks of my nails. It's the, it's the colour of the water. But that's not the only thing that went off. Outside light trickles in droves through the tattered tops of my curtain frame and the colour hypothermia. My walls are brown and cloistered, lying light twists in the sullen shadows and scars the walls into shattered bottles of apple cider. 
Wilting flowers grow on the tips of my windowsill and shiver in the cool alongside the sinking dread of the world outside it. Snow hoses a dying man far enough down the driveway that he knows not to try and join me. Because I've never really seen snow and it looks like bloody excrement and green hands pressed against my windows. <laughs> An apology is a lifetime too late. I've been here since I was six years old when I learned to look at this world from under the poisoned slats in my childhood bed and I learned to call this normalcy. I am the colour of sickness as is the world I have made to keep myself away from death but one day I know he will finish dying and I will be the one to kill him. And if I'm if I'm lucky, I might then get to take his place. Oi, he says, grabbing me by the cuff of my neck. He drags my head spluttering above the acidic gurgle and rolls his eyes when I grab at his boat, barnacle crusted and brilliant with what it feels to accidentally inhale underwater. I cough it up. He says, because it's his job, that I won't get any more tired. I am laughing at my stomach lining, the only thing my mouth has left to offer. Do they pay him minimum wage to tell jokes too? I clutch feebly at the ugly oysters, small cuts leapfrogging on my palm to brand my grip. I cough it up. Deciding not to defend himself, he holds his oar up. Kid, the nearest dock is a mile away. My arms don't give a fuck about continuing. His voice spoon feeds me exasperation, so my mouth accepts the offering and I hiss. Then what the hell are all these tiny forks? The whole damn river is a fumbled child's bait and you're the river man. Just drop me off somewhere. I cough it up anywhere. All these shortcuts and nowhere to go. Can I at least get on the boat? He snorts, adjusting the brim of his hat and stretches. I cough it up out his stiff legs. No space, he deadpans. I cough it up. He's wearing a polka dot affair, all blotches of green, which is my friend's favour, a cough it up red colour. I hate it on him. Don't judge the outfit, he says. You gave it to me as a birthday present a few years ago. I cough it, I cough it I decide I'll never give him a present ever again. Good riddance, he says, and I cough, cough, cough it up, pretend to be offended. Do you know what I mean? I ask, my hands now bloodied and stinging brightly. I let them drip into the river like I'm diluting watercolour. I'm still looking for a canvas after all. I'm not stupid, he mutters. I could cough, cough it up, it up, it up. It upends, and now the whole boat's upside down, and the river man's flailing in the water with me. My hands are burning, submerged. He wipes his sun-baked face futilely, and the last thing I hear is, don't do that again. I only have one pair of overalls. I cough. I cough. I c- I come home. The river man's hat sits lopsided on the dining table. It's getting dustier every day. They say the black of the berries, the sweet of the juice. But why, all of a sudden, does my blackness bear no fruit? Why, when I'm dying, does my voice have no sound? Why, when I'm prospering, do you choose to pull me down? With your token black girl and your black lives matter. <laughs> you sit calm, telling yourself it'll drown out the chatter. It'll kill the noise that you've been whispering in my ear that all you'll ever amount to is black. Do you and with that, you have the audacity to come to my face and ask me, why do y'all make everything about race? But you see, when your defense is louder than my struggle and you don't even realize that that is exactly where this problem lies. So with that, I'm going to come to you straight in my face and tell you, you made everything about race. When you asked me if my name was Shaniqua and acted surprised when I told you, no, it's Maria, because obviously 
My name is where my getiness resides. You still mistake me with every black girl's name in school, but won't ever mess up blonde haired Jade, Jasmine, or Jewel. I could go on about the pain that runs rife, but to sum it up, it's as simple as thug life. You see, I didn't choose it, the thug life chose me, and apparently you were deaf to my breathless plea. The hate you give little infants Fs everyone, and I haven't felt loved since he played with a toy gun. At the end of the day, all I'll be is a number in this game, simply because you chose to forget my name. And don't play victim here, because this is my truth. Just know the hate you give me, I will never give you. Uh, this is X by Fei Chen. Turn right, we'll head back along the wide strung path. Hit our shears against each other outside the car until only a few cups of sand are piled onto our seats. We'll drive to the nearest forwards at 2 a.m., raid the ice cream section, tip the tired 16-year-old with their first midnight shift as many $20 notes as we have in both our wallets. The seven are counting. We'll sit side by side at a pier-side seafood restaurant, one with those caged torches, maybe, as comfortably uncomfortable as we always are together, laugh about the stiffness of it before sunrise hits tomorrow. We'll buy a fourth floor apartment that's two streets away from the harbor. It's a downgrade from the ocean view modernist penthouse, but hey, it's still something. We'll go on six cruises by the time we're 80, and by the fifth one, you'll have convinced me to go on a water slide for the first time in my life. Turn left. There won't be a trace of us in the fossil record in a million years. There's a cliff with no lights below it in that direction, and all we can hear past that is the ocean. Do you think she'll welcome us? I'd like to think so. I'd forgotten what a good friend she was. And I've missed her more, but I've let on. We'll be so lost. Go missing, be the headlines for two days. Be the cold cases for the next three decades until some bones are found which have the slightest chance of being ours. I promise you, those won't be ours. We'll be so lost that we'll lose everything. Water, space, time. We could go to sleep on the ocean floor guarded by electric squid and wake up next to dinosaurs. We could drown a thousand times over in the Mariana Trench and still have enough air in our lungs to laugh that no one could ever find us. Thank you. Last but not least, it is my absolute joy to bring you the poetry winner, Box by Yahad Yassin. This was a sledgehammer of impactful prose and perspective. So assured and talented, it gave me goosebumps. Congratulations, Yahad. This was stunning. The clamoring of voices clashing and combining in this one small room we call home. The context long forgotten with a flow of emotion that is so twisted and contorted that the origin of its birth was tomorrow and its creation yesterday. Like a tree seed, a shell to its planted to life. These emotions, the whirlwind of identities and ideals, were born long before a reason for them was made. A barrel of thoughts, rational and irrelevant to the world around, seeking a target for release of desire. You're not my son, you're not my son. My father is dead and my mother is gone. It's your fault we live this way. It's your fault we live this way. The words of my mother will persist and persist. Even till her, till her skin has turned grey. You're a waste of air. It should be taken from you. You may be right, but the truth is far from the words you speak. You avoid us because you're filled with hate. No, I avoid you because I do not feel safe. Like a snake eating its tail, there's no end to the repetition of poisonous traps hissing in a pattern sending a blade down my spine. This may be my home, but I'll never call this family mine. Like a lone pagan against the oncoming crusaders, clutching my belief close to my ear, hearing it repeat its message, defying the onslaught of control, of control, of control. Or a place is an arrow that is fired from a bow, a word shot from a mouth, the words shot at me, laced with poison, wearing down my self-esteem and all is described as endless patience.
Creating a beehive of my sanity and stability. Harder, faster, smarter, quieter, louder, gentler, tougher, more, less. Running as fast as I can from the fear of being caught by the weight of always being just shy of enough. This past, this battle of pagan against crusader, of being just too shy of reaching the cookie jar, is long gone. Now my eyes are shining with the depth of a grave. The cookie jar, the cookie jar once just too far for me to reach is now centimetres away from being a light year too close. The only difference is... The only crusader is my fear of being enough. The only pagan is my fear of not being enough. Now there is no one left to keep me in check except for the man on the moon, a clump of rock called Beautiful, with craters of protective abuse. It reminds me that if they're not fed, if they're not fed love and acceptance from a silver spoon, we learn to lick it off a cold, rusted knife. That's it. All over. The Hachette Australia Prize for Young Writers 2021 is done. I would like to thank Express Media, the National Young Writers Festival, and of course, our sponsor, Hachette Australia. This is a really important award. It's important for us to show that we are trying to nurture and encourage young Australian writers and their voices. I congratulate the shortlist. I especially congratulate the winners and I urge you all to keep writing. I also urge you if you're watching this and thinking about submitting for next year to do it, please. We want to hear your voice. We want your stories. We want to nurture you and help you in your creativity to be part of our emerging writers community. Thank you so much for joining us. Are you a student in year 10 or 11 looking for another exciting writing opportunity? Do you know someone that is? Good news! VoiceWorks, Express Media, The Wheeler Centre and our national broadcaster have just the thing for you. It's the books that made us Youth Fiction Prize. Submit 300 words relating to landscape, be it a physical landscape, emotional landscape or political landscape, for the opportunity to develop your piece through writing workshops and editing for publication in a special VoiceWorks lift out. Pieces will be selected by Alice Pung, Claire Cow, Beck Kavanagh, and the voice of this ad, Dalia Nash Hussein. Entries due October 4th. You'll have the opportunity to develop the pieces later so they can be super drafty. Find out more at voiceworks.com.au slash all slash BTMU.